We're in the midst of March where the wind blows so hard that it messes everybody's hair up. <laughs> I was talking with Bruce Swanson this morning. He says, our hairdos are such that the only thing that would part our hair is a 120 mile an hour wind with a two by four throwing through it. So. <laughs> We're in the middle of a series dealing with the commandments of Jesus. The commandments of Jesus are a positive thing. Uh, they, they tell us how to live, how to act. Not so much what we don't do, but the things that we should do. Last few weeks we've been looking at Luke 9.23 and the requirements that are given in Luke 9.23. And we come to that port that, that talks about following me. In Luke 9.23 it says this, and let's read this together in respect for God's Word. Let's stand Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The Lord added his blessing to the reading of his word. Most of you know that I grew up in southern traditions. And therefore I listened to southern gospel growing up. And one of the songs I used to listen to is one by E.W. Blandy, written by John Norris in 1890, entitled, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. It says, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. The, the succeeding verses talk about such things as, I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the judgment. He will give me grace and glory. And it concludes with, I'll go with him, with him all the way. That's what following is. It's going with him all the way. But is that really our heart's desire to follow him? Is it? Are we willing to go with him anywhere, any place, any time, regardless of the effort that it takes, the hardship that it produces? Are we willing to do that? You know, I spoke on the issue of following Jesus back in October in, in, out of Matthew 5.19 where Jesus said, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You might recall that my conclusion from that verse is, If you ain't fishing, you ain't following. You know, that's part of following him is to be a, a fisher of men. But in, in the context of Luke 9.23, when we're looking at this verse, there's an increase growing progression of intensity in all that's going on at this point if anyone will come that's a decision of the will we have to decide call it intentionality call it what you like but it means we decide whether or not we'll follow and if we follow then we deny ourselves. That's turning from our selfish ways in doing things and turning to His will. It's His will, not my will, that's important. And then take up His cross to live in the shadow of the cross and to find satisfaction and true worth in Him and His goals, His purposes, to identify with Jesus. The final thing, that he says in this verse is to follow him, to follow. What does that mean? Uh, a while back, Bryant Raymond introduced me to a book by Kyle Adelman. And it's entitled, Not a Fan. You can either be a fan of Jesus or a follower of Jesus. Now, a fan of Jesus can sit on the couch and go, go Jesus, go. A, a fan of Jesus can wave a banner and wear a t-shirt that says, I support Jesus. And when Jesus wins, they go, woo, we won. But that's a fan. 
that's not a follower. A follower goes where Jesus goes. They go to practice. They appear on the field. They do the work. They just don't sit back and root Jesus on. Go, Jesus, go. Go, Jesus, go. A follower takes up the cross and plays the game with him. What does following Jesus entail? It entails a number of different things. It involves commitment. You know, when Jesus began his ministry, he called unto him 12 men. Uh, why he chose those? That's between him and himself. I mean, his God, he was sovereign. He chose these men. And he came to them and said, follow me. He called them to himself. And, and God calls people to himself. He called Moses. He called Abraham. He called Jacob and David and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And he calls me and you. And it becomes our decision to whether we follow him or not. When he says to us, follow me, he did not say, well, go back, take care of all your affairs, put them in order, go to seminary, and after six or eight or 10, 12 years, then come follow me. When he talked to the disciples and he gave them the command to come follow him, you know what they did? They dropped everything and follow. The commandment to follow Jesus occurs 18 times in the New Testament. He gives it. And each time it involves choosing to do what Jesus says. It means to follow his path, to go where Jesus goes. It means to follow his example, to do what Jesus does. It means to follow his words, to say what Jesus says. And it means to follow his suffering, to endure what he endures. That's what following Jesus is all about. And if we follow him, we will suffer. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, remember what Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 10, 24, and 25. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. So if the master suffered rejection, do you think we should? We will, in some form or fashion. And it takes commitment to live through that. Someone once said, Jesus had enough love to suffer for me that I might have enough faith to suffer for him. That's commitment. Not only does it take commitment, it takes action. You gotta do something. It's not just sitting passively and rooting Jesus on. There has to be something. Now, I understand it's difficult to follow Jesus. And it's getting more and more difficult in America with all the different things that are occurring and all the restrictions that are being placed on Christians. One man said, it's a shame. Now that there's no more praying in schools, kids will have to go to motels to read the Bible. <laughs> and if it keeps up this way, even the Gideons will have to go underground. And that's true. By the way, the Gideons will be here next week and uh, we do take a special offering for the Gideons when they come. So come prepared to give a second offering or associated with the giving of the Gideons. That's just a side note. What action did the disciples take when Jesus said, follow me? They did not ask, where are we going? They didn't ask, how much luggage can I take? They didn't say, how many pairs of shoes do I need? They didn't say, what was the pay on this, by the way? How much will I make? They dropped their nets and followed Jesus where he went. Now, I imagine if you're John and James's dad and here your son's traipsing off following this Jesus, I'm sure you're... Your comment would have been something like, you guys must be crazy. 
I mean, we got this successful business going on here. We got fish to catch and people to feed. What are you doing? Marching off. They left the boat. They left the business and followed him. Everything was left behind. Parent, occupation. They didn't even stop to fix the nets or arrange the nets. They just went. When Jesus calls us to follow him, we just go. We do. It takes commitment. It takes action. There's also a cost involved. A great cost. You know how much it'll cost? Everything. Everything. I don't know if you know the story of William Borden. William Borden was heir to the Borden Milk family. You know, you know Borden's Milk. Anybody know Borden's Milk besides me? He was... At 16, he was a millionaire, but because of all the, the family money. His high school graduation present from his dad was a free trip around the world. And during this trip around the world, you know what happened? God got a hold of him and, and laid on his heart to come follow him and become a missionary. You know how disconcerting that was to his dad? To send him on a world cruise and came back and says, Dad, I want to be a missionary. No, son, I want you here and running this wonderful milk company that we have that produces and, and makes all this money. He decided to go to Yale, get an education. He didn't prepare himself for ministry. He followed God and did ministry. His first year at Yale, he and a friend decided to get up every morning and read the Bible and pray before breakfast. Before long, other people began to join them. By the end of his freshman year, 150 men were praying and doing Bible study before breakfast. By his senior year, 1,000 of the 1,200 students at Yale University were reading their Bible and praying regularly. And it didn't stop there. He went downtown and shared the gospel with the drunks. One of his friends said, you might find Borden often in the lower parts of the city at night on the street in a cheap lodging house or some restaurant in which he had taken a poor hungry fellow to feed him, seeking to lead that person to Christ. In the process, he gave away all his money. And he wrote in his Bible, no reserves. No reserves. God laid on Borden's heart to go to the Muslim Kensu people of China. He made that decision. He says, this is what God would have me to do. There'll be no turning back. There'll be no, no regrets. So he wrote in his Bible, no regrets of giving away all his money. At age 25, he set sail for China. But along the way, he decided that he would stop in Cairo and learn, you know, to speak the Arabic language. A month after he arrived in Egypt, he contacted spinal meningitis and died. When they opened his Bible, they found three statements. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. When the world heard that William Borden had died, every newspaper in America carried the story. Uh, Mary Taylor, writing in her biography, says, a wave of sorrow went around the world 
Borden not only gave away his wealth, but himself in such a joyous and natural fashion that it seemed a privilege, not a sacrifice. Is that our lives? No reserves. No retreats. No regrets. It cost something to serve Jesus. Is that our attitude? Another thing that involves is letting Him lead. When you follow, who's in charge? Who's in front? Jesus. Not me. It means to go where He goes. I I don't know if you know who Steve Sane is. Maybe you heard of his dad, Nate Saint. Nate was the pilot who flew Jim Elliott in and the five were killed. Well, Steve became a missionary pilot as well. And he served the Lord as a missionary pilot. And a couple of years ago, 18 months, two years ago, he was flying an experimental airplane and it crashed and nearly killed him. He struggled in the, in the recovery process, regaining control of his body. He gave a, a message in 2013 entitled, Let God Write Your Story. You don't make the rules up. You let God do it. He, here's an excerpt from that sermon. I want you to, to see what he says. Now pay close attention. Would you help me out? Okay, that's good, thank you. That's good. I'm just going to sit down here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can do this. You got it? I can do this, you know, this is like missions. Whenever something happens that we don't expect, we, we North Americans always want to, want to run in and fix it. <laughs> and sometimes what we need to do is we need to just wait and give the people there a chance. I can do this. I can do this. No, I can. I can do this. I just need a chance. I didn't know if that was going to work or not. (laughs) You know what? You know what they told me at the rehab hospital? My wife, Jenny. Yeah, I don't want to do that one. (laughs) My wife, Jenny, and... Son Jamie's. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, my wife Jenny and Jamie, my son Jamie's wife, made a huge picture of Jenny and me sitting by. We got a big oak tree out in the back, and uh, we call it our family tree because we get all of our grandkids every year, and we go and we they climb up in the branches of the tree, and Jenny and I sit down below and. When I was at the hospital, I just, I just missed my grandchildren, 17 now, so badly. And so they made this picture and blew it way up and put it on the wall of my room. And every day, 
I didn't wear my glasses for three months because it didn't matter what I saw. All I had to do is is wake up about 13 times every night in excruciating pain and try to get somebody to move my head a little bit so I could breathe a little bit better. And uh, then in the morning when the light started coming in, I would look at that picture and, and that's what I'd say. I'm going to live for those kids. Because if I can't do anything else, at least I can love the next generation that's coming. And then one day, and Dave, I don't know where Dave, Dave, where are you? Dave over there was with me, and uh, one, of the, one of the therapists came into my room and said, uh, is this all your family? And I said, well, this is all except for our three sons and their wives. Uh, there's 25 of us, I guess, now. And they said, uh, you know, that's going to be a problem. And I thought, well, are you kidding me? I've got 17 lovely grandchildren and three sons that have good relationship with. That's almost a miracle. And, and three daughter-in-laws who are loving and kind to Jenny and to me. I said, tell me how that can be a problem. They said, we are here. Our job is to rehabilitate you. Our job is to teach you how to do things in this new body. And they said, what's going to happen, and that we see it happen over and over and over, is that when we have patients who have a big and loving family, what happens is we work and work and work to get them ready to do a lot of things that they don't know how to do now in this new unimproved body. And they said, and then we send them home, and the people that don't have anybody at home or maybe have a little bit of help, they progress. But those that have loving, big family around them, that family does so much for them that they digress. And I thought, that's exactly what happens in missions. We go, and thinking it's loving, we do for people what they can do for themselves. And in the process of trying to be Christ-like to them, what we do is we ruin the chances for them to do what God has called them to do. It's rather intriguing, isn't it? You know, the comments that, that he makes. You know, I understand a little bit about that. You know, when I had my knee surgery... Uh, working with an orthopedic nurse, my wife, and I got home and I said, "Hun, would you go get me a snack?" And she'd say, "Go get it yourself." <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> but but it does. I mean, rather than learning from an experience and growing from it, what we do is we seek all sorts of help and support. We don't learn, we become dependent, we enable. We don't allow God to write the story in our life because we don't like the story God's writing. We don't like the circumstances and situations and as a result we, we rebel against it. Well, how's my life going to be different? How do we apply this to our lives? Here are certain ways that we can do that. We got to decide, am I a fan or am I a follower? What's the difference between a fan and a follower? (laughs) It's the one who does. It reminds me of the mother who had four boys. And if you've raised four boys, you know at times they get rather rambunctious. You know, and they get at odds at each other and who's the boss and, you know, all this other stuff. And she was constantly frustrated by all these boys. And then she was at church and the the pastor gave this wonderful sermon uh, uh, about turning the other cheek. And regardless of what anybody else does, you don't respond in kind. She went, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope the boys got it. That afternoon, 
The youngest boy comes crying to her, bawling. The older brother had just kicked him. Why in the world had he kicked you? Because I kicked him. <laughs> says, well, you shouldn't go around kicking other people. And, and, and he responded, but the pastor said that he's not supposed to kick back. Isn't that like us? We want other people to follow, but not ourselves. You know, being a follower of Christ will cost you. It will cost you. It will cause you to care about the eternity of lost souls. Because Jesus is concerned about lost souls. It, it will cost you... Because it will make you sacrifice your own privileges and desires for the needs of others. Because that's what Jesus did. It will cause you to serve in ways in ministry that meets the needs of others regardless of how comfortable you feel about it. Because that's what Jesus did. It will cause you to help people hear the truth about Jesus. Who he is and what he's done. Being a fan requires no commitment. It just means sitting on the sideline and being somewhat emotional every now and then. But being a follower requires action. Doing something. God has called us to be followers, not fans of Jesus. What happens to many people, though? They think that they made a decision for Jesus and that's all that's required. They can go and curl up in the sofa and when it's all over, Jesus will come and get them. Uh, Jesus did not say, come and sit and wait for me. He didn't say that. He didn't say, find a comfortable place and hang out or hide out until I come back. He said, follow me. Follow me. Don't root me on. Get in the game. We set our hand to the plow and we don't turn back. We don't regret. No reserves. No regrets. No retreats. That's what Jesus is all about. But in our day and age, we want to know, what do I get from following Jesus? If I follow him, what do you get? I'll tell you what you're going to get. You're going to get opposition from the world. You will. The world will hate you. Oh, you may enjoy some pleasantness for times and periods and success and all those other things. But eventually, the world's going to come after you. That's what you're going to get. But that's okay. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through it. That's all. What we get on the other side is a whole lot more. When we follow Jesus, we get passion. You show me a person that's following Jesus, and you'll show me a person who has passion because Jesus sets them on fire and they burn. They burn for Jesus with an eternal flame for the loving God who died for them. Jesus will grab your heart and you will pursue him with diligence and go where he goes and do what he asks you to do. Whatever that is. And it may be difficult. And you may experience hardship. But the joy of the Lord will be yours and yours forever and ever. And your reward in heaven can't even begin to be imagined. 
we have to make a decision to follow him regardless of the circumstances it's our decision it's our choice I don't know if you know who Jeremiah Denton is retired Navy Admiral aviator ran for Senate in Alabama and actually won for one term but that's not why we remember him he was a believer who was shot down over North Vietnam he was the longest held captive eight years eight years they, they interviewed him on television and, and while they were interviewing he blinked out in Morse code tortured on the day they flew him home February 12th 1973 he stood at the podium and he said these words we are honored to have had the opportunity to serve our country under difficult circumstances we are profoundly grateful to our commander-in-chief and to our nation for this day God bless America the day is coming when we will stand before Jesus we're delivered from the captivity the POW status that we have in this world in that day will we be able to stand and say this we are honored to have had the opportunity to serve our Lord under difficult circumstances we are proudly profoundly grateful for our commander in chief Jesus Christ will we be able to do that that's what following will entail it's time to drop our regrets leave our fears abandon the money tables and take him as our security take him as our family take him as our portion let him lead us and don't look back don't look back there can be no going back there is nothing back there worth going to and where he leads I will follow where he leads I will follow where he leads I will follow I'll go with him I'll go with him all the way. Would you join me in prayer?